My name is Laird Klingler. I'm a librarian with the uh, Cornish Historical Society. Um, we're here at the Daisy S. Savage's home for an interview. Uh, Billy Scharf will be doing the filming, and the date is September 13th, uh, 2018. You know, before we start with the interview, I, I just wanted to mention that for the Historical Society, uh, this is like coming home. Uh, at the History Center, I found a uh, uh, the old VHS tape of an interview that Bernice Johnson uh, did with your father, Mike Yetsevich. And so um, I asked uh, Matt Wood to transform it into digital digital format and uploaded it to YouTube. And uh, it's, it's proven to be one of the most popular <laughs> interviews we've ever done, you know, when there's so many hits, you know, on that. And also, I, I do remember being here before with our neighbor to neighbor group and helping Claudia yes. you know, move in. But, but uh, Daisy, we want, to, uh, we want to learn about you um, <laughs> also. So uh, let, let's start with uh, where and uh, when you were born. Well, I was born in Baltimore. Um, um, my parents owned this place. My sister, older sister Mary, was born in Windsor. Um, and so the family had started here. Um, and then um, World War II came along and my grandmother had a farm in, uh, my mother's mother uh, ran a farm in, um, in, outside of Baltimore in um, a place called My Lady's Manor, <clears throat> Jackson, uh, Jacksonville, and um, Maryland. And um, she, uh, when World War II got underway, um, she didn't have uh, anybody to run the farm because the the capable people had gone gone as soldiers um, and my father um, who is a farmer here um, said all right I'll, I'll I'll manage your farm for um, uh, during for the war duration duration of the war and so he left they left this farm here and went down and ran her farm <clears throat> in Maryland um, for two years mm -hmm. and I I was born in 1946, um, so right after the at, the, at the end of the war, after the war was over, um, and they were wrapping up their time in Maryland. And when I was three months old, they moved back here to this house. And you, you were three. Three months. Three months. Three months oh. old. I was an infant. Yeah. Oh. So they came back here to to get restarted with their own own dairy farm here again so and where we are now this was the home this set. was the house that yeah that i that i really started in you know um, um yes i lived in my grandmother's house for, uh, for the first three months of my life but then um this is where i grew so up so pretty much lifelong at yeah. least the beginning yeah yeah yes, yes. yeah um well tell, tell tell us about your childhood here in cornish well, <laughs> it was isolated, I guess you could say, in in the sense that there weren't any neighborhood yes, Tell us, where, where are we, just for the record here, or on Fernald Hill? This is the, uh, this is the end of the road. Um, the, the, the road used to go up past the house and over to the flat, but at the time I, was, I grew up here, um, it had been discontinued, and it was a class six road and the road ended here at this house the 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 town road so <clears throat> it's about two miles up from uh, the paved road from meriden um from the meriden stage road and um it's a dirt road yes. and there there weren't a lot of other houses on the road um the 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 next house down they had um i think 11 children in there um but uh, we didn't see a whole lot of them. Um, and we pretty much, my sister and I, and then when Michael was born, my brother, who was born a, a year and a half, when I was a year and a half old, we just played up here. We played in the, in the fields and in the woods. And um, we, we had a small, my father had a small dairy farm, and we would drive the cows out to pasture through this was more open and there was a pasture um, that way and we'd drive the cows out in the morning or, or go and get them in the afternoon and drive them back for milking from that pasture. Um, and we would build tents. Out did, did you do milking? 
Not really. You know, we try it a little bit. It was probably um, by hand at that time. Yeah, it was by hand at first. Yep, that's yeah, right. Yeah. He only had about 10, um, 10 milking cows at that time. There was a barn out here that isn't there anymore. And um, we had, my mother had some ducks and some chickens and a pig or two. And um, she had some sheep. Um, but it was mostly a, a dairy farm, and he sold um, he sold milk in um, that, that was cooled in a water cooler in cans. That there were two handles on either side of the cans, and sometimes you see these cans that that are used for mailboxes now um, around town. But um, he the milk would go into the he'd pour the milk into those cans and then put and then lift them into this. A water cooler to cool, and then the, a truck would come and pick them up. Pick them up. I think pretty much every day, yeah. every day or every other day. <clears throat> and I think um, I think they also sold cream, or maybe it was just cream because we had a cream separator, and I can remember, and 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 it was a hand crank cream separator. They pour the milk into this bowl of. Um, for the of the separator and then crank it through and the and the milk would go through a series of filters that would separate the butter fat the mm. the milk fat from the skim milk. Do you remember what kind of cows you had? Jersey, mostly Jersey. Jersey cows. Yeah, there were a few yeah. um, brown Swiss, I think, and yeah, yeah brown Swiss here and there, but um, mostly it was Jerseys and maybe a Guernsey or two, mm. a couple of Guernseys. I had a cow named I, my one named Buttercup that was my favorite cow. She was kind of a blonde jersey. <laughs> and then... Um, <laughs> my I grandfather had, had, had jersey cows yeah. in New Jersey. You yeah. don't see us too many jerseys up here. Uh, Billings Farm has some. I know. Well, I know. Linda Rice, she, she, Linda, she right. uh, pastures right. 15 heifers here every summer now. Oh, oh really? Yep, the yeah. cows that you see up in the pasture there right now are, are Linda's. And they're a mixture, but uh, probably the largest number of them are Jerseys. Jerseys? Yeah, you know, Jerseys, Guernseys, yeah. some, uh, I think she's got four Holsteins there. When it came time to, to going to town, was Windsor the town you went to? Or? Mostly, yes. The side yeah. of town tended yes. to go to Windsor, the other side. To that's Canada, right, that's right. correct, yeah, yeah. yeah. But there was, a, there was a store in, in Plainfield Village called Plumber's Store, which is... I think it's the building where that used furniture place is now um, on on the you know on the main mm, street, yeah. um, and then there was Thornton store at, at the flat. At the flat. Yeah. You you remember going there? I I do. Yeah, I remember going to Thornton store and I remember going to Plumber's store, mm -hmm. and so for for quick things that we needed, um, there would be one of those two stores. But for for the main grocery shopping, it would it would be in Windsor. I always like to ask. Uh, of course, Windsor has changed so much. What are your memories of Windsor when you from going there? I remember well the the grocery store we shopped at was called Cummings Store, and it was on right on the when you cross the bridge and you come to the what's now the stoplight. It was that building on the left that's now being I think it's being re. Um, re what, what's the word fixed up you yeah. know? restored maybe um, and um, there wasn't you know there was no price chopper or any, anything like that so it was that coming mm -hmm. coming store which is a you know small um, corner store kind of place um, but you could get the basics there um, I remember on Main Street um, past the, the main um, stoplight in the middle of town, the, stop, the stoplight in the, in the middle of town, just past it on the right, there was a, a dry goods store. I can't remember the name of it. But they sold, um, you could buy cloth for making clothes. And we, we made most of our own clothes. My, my mother taught my sister and me how to sew. Um, so we'd buy patterns there and, mm. and make clothes. Mm. And I was, I belonged to 4-H and we learned how to do basic, some basic sewing. What about the movies? There were movie theaters. There, there was a movie theater. That's right. Where was it? Um, I think it would have been just on the other side of, uh, well, there were two. One was just on the other side of that State Street 
um, uh, traffic light. Yes. Yes, I think you're right. Um, so that would have been right next to that dry goods store. Right. Yeah. I always like to ask, do you, do you remember the m first movie you saw? Or do you remember any of the movies? Boy, it wasn't very often because movies cost money. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I remember this was, I do remember going to see um, uh, Snow White. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, Disney's Snow White. But I was older then. We were living at Barbary House then. We didn't live here at that time. Oh. So I was probably 10 or 11 maybe by then. And um, we went with uh, <clears throat> a young boy fr uh, that lived next door to us at Barbary House. Um, <clears throat> and he, um, he got scared of the witch, of the, of the stepmother. <laughs> and he he was so scared that he he demanded to go home, and my mother had to leave us kids in the theater, to, and she had to take him back home. And what was the occasion that you were living at Barbary House? We when we were nine, uh, when I was nine, um, my her her father died, passed away. Her fa he lived in Maryland, and he left her some money, and she had always loved Barbary House, loved the the look of it, and the you know. Um, history and whatnot it was it was owned by Homer St. Gaudens at that time, so Augustus St. Gaudens' son, who had, who was living in Florida and was trying to sell it and couldn't sell it, um, and um, so when she inherited some money, she, and we and she was pregnant with my youngest brother, so so there were four of us, and he, and she was about to have number five, <clears throat> and she felt this was pretty cramped here. <laughs> And so she wanted to move into a bigger house, and so she she bought Barbary House with her inheritance money, and we moved in there. Oh. And that's where I lived until I, where we lived until I left home. You know, and they. Well, did Mike stay here then for the farm? No, did... he lived down there, yeah. and they at the, then they used this. They rented this to. I mean, they um, a, they they got a hired man to help with the farm to do help with the milking and the and the haying and everything. And he lived, um, he and his wife lived here. And funnily enough, um, she, um, uh, their name was Earl Potter. I don't know if you've heard of him. He, um, he's, he, he became a plumber later on, but he was, he and his wife Phyllis lived here. And I have been thinking about them in the last few years and wondering whatever became of them and thinking I'd love to look them up. Mm. And about a month ago, Somebody knocked at the door, <laughs> and the woman said, do you, do you know me? Do you remember me? And I said, I don't think so. And she said, my name is Phyllis Potter. And I was so thrilled because, because she just came to me rather than me trying to track her down. I guess Earl has passed away, but she wanted to get really? together. We're yeah. going to get together. So <laughs> what were the years then that you were lived at the Barbary House, approximately? Or, you know, okay, or, so... We moved, I, um, I was nine in 19, oh, well, my, it was 1955, because Gregor was born in 1955, my Gregor, my, my youngest brother, my younger brother. And you were nine? And I was nine, going on and then, ten. Did you stay there then through high school? Yes, yes. I went, yes, yeah. okay. yep. Now, before high school, um, where did you go to school here in Cornish then? Well, my first year went to the Tracy School, oh, really? the one-room school on oh, Lang really? Road, yeah. um, and Mrs. Bernard, Eva Bernard, Eva Bernard. Was, my, yes. was my teacher, um, yeah. and I was for, in first grade. Um, there were six of us in first grade, um, and there were six in seventh grade, and then various others in grades between. I think my sister Mary was a th the one third grader, um, but Stuart Hodgman was in the seventh grade, and Mrs. Bernard placed the, placed uh, the the seventh graders next to the sixth graders, uh, the the first graders next to the seventh graders, so that the seventh graders could help us with our work if we hmm. if we needed it and could make sure that we stayed on task. And, um, um, Sandra Yaten, who lives in um, in Plainfield. You probably have heard of Kyle Witte because yes. he, yeah, it's her, his his mother was in that first grade class. Oh, um, oh. Augusta Comstock, Augusta Yaten, and then later Augusta Comstock, 
uh, was her mother, and they lived in Cornish, where Kyle now lives. I see. Um, and um, so she was one of them, uh, a Carol Claflin, a Sylvia Abbott, who was a foster uh, child of, um, of Martha, Fit Martha and Orville Fitch, was a classmate, and me and um, a boy named um, Peter Blake. And Peter Blake was a bit of a, a naughty boy, I remember. And so he was placed next to Stuart, who was the, who was the, oh, he, 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 he did things right. You know, he was kind of a, um, well, I, he, and his, a mo his type. mother was associated with the school, right? No, that I don't know. Yeah, Could yeah. very well yes, have been, I, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. I didn't. I guess I didn't know too much about the workings at the yeah. at the upper level. So Stuart kept you all in. in he he yeah. kept us all in line. Yes, <laughs> and but he sure. was you know yeah. he was very helpful. He you know I remember liking him very much, yeah. um, and he. Um, <laughs> I remember um, <clears throat> an, an incident. He. Um, I had a brand new snowsuit that that winter. And it had a, a hat that kind of clamped onto my head. You know, it was not attached to my snowsuit. And um, and and we had an outhouse. That was the the sanitary facility at the one room school. And I remember I <laughs> I'd had to go to the outhouse and I you know put on my snow. It was midwinter and it was cold and I'd put on my snowsuit to go out to the outhouse. And I accidentally dropped my hat down in the in the toilet in, oh. the, in the outhouse <laughs> and I was just mortified and so upset and I didn't dare tell anybody um you know when you're six years old or seven years old you, <laughs> you know those things are major and so I I um when my mother came to pick us up to, to pick me up yeah pick, pick us up um I just burst into tears you know and I I was she said, what in the world is the matter? I said, I dropped my hat in the outhouse. <laughs> and, you know, thinking it was so, so bad because it was a brand new snowsuit. And, you know, anything brand new was very special in those days because most, mostly you got hand-me-downs. And and um, and she she kind of half laughed and, <laughs> and said, it's all right, we'll take care of it. And so she went in and told Mrs. Bernard, and Mrs. Bernard sent Stuart out to the outhouse with a coat hanger. <laughs> And he he filched it out of the outhouse. Oh, he got it out. And got it out. And my mother, we brought it home, and my mother washed it, and I got to wear it again. Okay, but, it, you know, those are the kinds of incidents. I remember that there was, um, the the playground was basically just the the grounds around the the building, but we did have um, a swing set and a, and a seesaw. And there was a little cluster of trees in the area, and we would go in there to play house or you know whatever um and we were sent out to to recess probably more frequently than 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 other kids because you know we didn't we were young and didn't have that much really to do so you were the, that was that your first year there it was my first year in school yeah. it would have been my <clears throat> my sister's third year I think. There. and then after that was the central school no, we, then there was one year after that when we actually spent that the winter with my gra with my grandmother in Maryland. Um, I didn't know it at the time, but years and years later, I learned that my parents were having a trial separation at that that particular year, which would have been let's see, uh, I can't do the math on that fifty let's see fifty four I mean fifty two fifty three I guess. And, but during that year, the consolidation school was being built. And I went to my mother and some other people in Maryland near where my, uh, my grandmother's farm hired a woman, and, uh, an English woman, who, who, taught, who was our teacher. And we sort of had another one-room school experience. She mm. was teaching. There were about 11 of us, I think. My, my, then you came back to Cornish? Then we came back to Cornish. I guess there was a reconciliation. Mm. And um, we came back and... Um, the new the new school was opening in the fall of 1954. How did you get to the school? Oh, <laughs> well, we um, let's see. For the Tracy School, um, my parents took us down there to to Lang Road and picked us up. <clears throat> but then for for the Cornish School, um, 
they took us in the morning they took us down to the corner where the where the um sugar house is it, it's the corner of where saint gaudens road and hell hollow road and fernald hill road meet yes and um there's a big yellow house there now yes, that yes. we <clears throat> that we call the altai house um my grandparents call, call the what altai hill house the, in the family, we call it the Altai Hill House, A-L-T-A-I. And the hill behind there is called Altai Hill. And my grandparents, my Russian grandfather and his, and his wife lived there when they first moved up to Cornish. Oh. Um, and um, and he, he was the one, he had, he had been born in the Altai Mountains in Siberia. And the, this area reminded him of the Altai region in Russia. And so um, he he called it the Altai House. And eventually, when the map when the map people came around in the early fifties to update the topographical maps, the the um, I don't know what the the U.S. U.S. geological yeah, geological yeah. survey people. Right. They asked my father, well, what's the name of this hill? And he said, well, that's Altai Hill. <laughs> <laughs> and then there was Fernald Hill, which was on the map, which is up here. And then there's another hill up here that didn't have a name. And he said, and what's the name of that hill? And he said, oh, that's Yatsevich Hill. And they wrote it down, so it's now <laughs> Yatsevich <laughs> Hill. <laughs> and then they wanted to, to check on the name of the road um, that's that's called Hell Hollow Road, and and he said that's Hell Hollow Road, <laughs> so that went on the map. It's Hell Hollow Road, so you know that's how 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 places get do named. Do you remember um, your reaction going from a one room schoolhouse to a larger central school? Well, um, let's see. I I guess I was I guess I was all right with it. Um, it was it was. A shock to be with so many children because we were the leading edge of the ba baby boom that year, um, and there were between thirty-five and thirty-eight children in our in each class, um, um, and um, I was, you know, I, I I wasn't used to being among that many children, and also I was tall, so I was always at the back of the room. They they placed you according to your height in the in the rows, and we were sit, always you know sitting in rows back in those days. But I liked school, and I liked studying, learning things, and reading and writing and whatnot. And apparently, I had learned to read before I went to school, um, according to my mother. And um, so it was you know it was enjoyable for me. But I've talked to some of my old classmates since then, and they hated it. <laughs> Why do you think? Well, some of the boys, they said that the women teachers were mean to them and everything. <laughs> no. I did the, I was, went into the fourth grade that year, and um, I had, in Maryland, I had done two years in one. The, 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 this woman, this English woman had, had, had me do the work for two years in one. And um, so when I came back, I went from first to fourth grade, and my teacher was a Mrs. Simons. I don't know if you've encountered her name before, but she was, she was, she was kind of mean. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and she didn't like the fact that I had done, that I had gone from first to fourth grade, and there were no records, you know, no official records from Maryland of my doing that. So she Somehow, I think she thought we were cheating or something by by having me skip mm. skip a grade, and so she picked on me a bit, you know. But I I I I knew how to lay low and you know keep out of trouble. Although one day um, I was looking out the window when I w uh, when I wasn't supposed to because I happened to be seated by the window, and she made me stand in the corner because I was looking out the window. You remember that? <laughs> yeah, I do because it was. <laughs> Only time that ever happened. <laughs> now, um, when it came time for high school, then yes, did you go to Windsor? No, um, there was a little private school in Wood South Woodstock, Vermont. It was called the Woodstock Country School, mm. and um, the the woman who had helped start that school in the late nineteen forties. It was a progressive school. Um, was a friend, the woman who helped start was a friend of my grandmother's in Maryland, and she was a progressive educator. She she was the head of the Baldwin School in, I think it was in Philadelphia, where my mother had gone to school. And um, 
and um, she was uh, um, among a, a, a group of progressive women um, in that area at that time who were pushing for, for uh, innovation in education. And so this school was um, started and the, the principal of it, the headmaster was a man named David Bailey. And he, um, it was really a, a one person school. He, he had a vision for a, a, a democratic kind of school. Most of the students who were there, there were a hundred of us at the school and most of them were from Connecticut and New York and, um, and Massachusetts, places further. Mm further afield, um, and, um, and they boarded there. They had dormitories there. Um, we had a student council, and we, um, um, the, 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 the student council had quite a role in um, running, making decisions about how the school should be run, you know, what, what scheduling and things like that. Did you live at home? I think. But I was a day student, yes. Day student. And and it's about it was about a twenty mile. Um, How did you get to school? We our our parents. One parent would take us. You know, oh. my mother or my father. And, well, and just for the record, the name of the school again. Woodstock Country School. It was in South Woodstock. And it was in South Woodstock. Yep. And it was it had been a farm. Um, and they had bought the farm and made it over into um, into classroom buildings. The main building, the main classroom building, had been the main barn. Is it still in existence? Or? No, it it when he died or when he retired and it was taken over by um, other, run by other um, uh, principal headmasters. They didn't have the same vision, and also um, this was after I had graduated. In the 1970s, um, that was when um, drugs, you know, more marijuana and that kind of thing had come into into being more. I never saw that when I was there. The the big offenses were if somebody was caught drinking, you know, and um, and if they were caught, they would get <coughs> expelled. But um, things got a little too progressive and liberal, I guess, after after David Bailey um, died. He seemed to be able to keep a balance of, of, of yeah. um, you know, st student decision making and and what needed to be decided mm -hmm. by the adults. So to speak. did the rest of your family also go? Uh... My my mother went for. I mean, my sister Mary went for one year. Um, it was the it was very academically rigorous and. Um, and that was a little too hard for her, so she 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 only went for the one year, and then went to um, she went to St. Johnsbury Academy, where she really thrived. And your brother? And he 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 went for one year, and by then I was a senior, and um, so he and I drove back and forth. I had gotten my I had my license by then, mm -hmm. and I was driving I was driving us. Um, my mother got us a Land Rover. Because she figured that if we had an accident, <laughs> it would be like being in a tank and we'd be, <laughs> be safer. Sure, sure. We, there was something wrong with the needle valve in the in the Land Rover. It would stick open, and suddenly the Land Rover would run away with me. And I, and and the only way to stop it was to turn the key off. And so I, we learned how to, you know, stop it, pull over on the side, and then Michael would open the hood. And take apart the carburetor and loosen up the needle valve and put it back together again. My goodness! And then we'd <clears throat> we'd be on our way again. Yeah. But after a while, this got tedious. We um, we learned that he could open it op open it up, and I could start the engine, and he would take a wrench and whack the carburetor on the top, and that would loosen up the needle valve so we didn't have to go through, go through taking all it all apart and putting it back together again. Okay, let's I, don't, move, let's I don't know that we ever told, told my parents that that's what that. we were doing. Let's move on after high school then. College or what, what came next for you? Um, I worked the summer after I graduated, I worked at a, at a uh, private club in um, Maine. Um, one of the dorm mothers at Woodstock, at the Woodstock Country School, ran, in, for her summer work, she ran a, a private club on the coast of Maine, in, in Small Point, Maine, near near Bath, Maine. <clears throat> and um, 
and she would recruit um, uh, students from the school to go there to be waitresses and and chambermaids and and scullery maids and whatnot. And so my best friend um, Kayla Metcalf and I and her sister were recruited that summer to to work at the club. And um, that was you know my first summer away from <laughs> home and um and i and while we were there there was another fellow that she had recruited locally to be um a a um oh he would he would start steward i guess you could call it he would start the fires and he would do odd jobs and bring wood in and that kind of thing for this club and and um he we were all friends and his brother his older brother had been traveling uh, on a dare in Africa. His name was Robert Finney. And he'd gone to Africa just, just to travel around for, for the fun of it. And um, he came back and he was broke. And so his brother Peter um, got, got the uh, Ginny, the uh, woman who was managing the club, to hire him to come and give a slideshow of his adventures in Africa. And I was just enchanted. <laughs> so, so we were dating, and then I went to Goucher College that fall, for which was near near where my grandmother was no. outside of Maryland, yeah, outside of uh, Baltimore, and and near my grandmother's farm. And um, so I went there for a year. I was miserable there. I was far away from home. I didn't know anybody. Um, I had been in this small, intimate high school with a hundred students where you knew everybody, and here I was in a, even though it was only, I think, 800 students at Goucher, it was still overwhelming for me. Living in a dormitory with a roommate who, who liked to study all night, and, and so I wasn't getting enough sleep, and I was very unhappy. And my boyfriend, who Robert, who was in Maine, you know, was far away. <clears throat> And so at the end of that year, um, I got a job as a camp counselor in Maine and was dating Robert again. And then we decided to get married oh, at the end oh. of that summer. <laughs> so we eloped, much oh, to really? my mother's <laughs> dismay. Robert is an artist. Um, he's a very, very fine artist, um, world-class artist, sculptor, he, a bird sculptor. And so we, you know, we, um, the draft was in effect, and um, we were um, upset and about the Vietnam War. Um, we we had done a lot of reading about it and felt that it was an unjust war. Um, and but and Robert tried to do an alternative service. You know, he offered to work in a hospital or do some alternative service. They were they they wouldn't allow it, um, but we did. The Peace Corps was an alternative, and so mm. I said, "Let's let's try that." And he wasn't so sure about it, but I had heard about the Peace Corps when it first started up at Woodstock, and it's the kind of thing that the Woodstock Country School would have, you know, talked a lot about and been excited about it. We we had gone on peace marches in New York and that kind of thing. And, um, and so I looked into it. I we did took the tests. We were accepted for the Peace Corps, and um, we went to Venezuela for two years. And we were, we really? were, yeah, we were in the Peace Corps in Venezuela. So we felt like you know they were getting two for one uh, for for service to the country, and um, and that you know we felt we felt we were serving the country, and. Um, and and it was a seminal experience for me because I was very shy and and um, <clears throat> it kind of opened me up. I for some reason I was able to do more public speaking or speak to groups of people in Spanish better than, <laughs> than I was in English. <laughs> and I I still don't understand that dynamic except that mm. I suppose it's a form of mask, but. Um, but I was I was more comfortable talking you know talking publicly to a group you know we we helped build a school while we were there so it involved going around and soliciting materials and then talking to groups of people about volunteering to do the work and um, you know 
and on weekends, the people in the barrio where we lived were um, um, would volunteer their time, and the women in the barrio would make big pots of soup, and a beer company donated cases of beer, and so it was kind of a party every weekend, um, putting together the school, and then during the week, I would be, go around and, and solicit materials that we needed, and Robert, who was very good at, at construction and whatnot, would prefabricate parts of the school mm. that then would be put together um, on the weekends. And so, so th that was the equivalent then of his draft. And that was a that was a deferment. Yeah. Yes, yes. You were, if you were in the Peace Corps, it was a it was it was a legitimate de deferment. Mm. Yeah. And when we came back, he was too old to be drafted. So um, we lived in Maine for a while, and then um, and we looked. We were looking for a place he, to to live, you know, to see if we could find to buy. And he needed um, he needed uh, shorebirds and and um, upland game birds for his art. He did. He sculpted uh, du uh, ducks, mallards, black ducks, teal. Uh, Canada geese, um, partridge, pheasants, you know, the, those kinds of birds. And, um, but we couldn't afford anything, uh, you know, to, to buy a place. Um, he went looking across the continent, went as far as British Columbia and back, <clears throat> trying, to, trying to find a place. Of course, there's no upland game or shorebirds in British Columbia because it's all <laughs> fjords there. So he would, came back and then we started looking on, in Canada. And we found, he found an, uh, a semi-abandoned farm in Nova Scotia and uh, that we could, that we had enough money to put a down payment on. And um, so we moved to Canada oh. and it <clears throat> turned out that right in the neighborhood, in the same, same town virtually, um, was another Finney family and it turned out that we, that he was related to them, that in fact it was his... Um, his father's cousins, some cousins of his father's, um, sort of second cousins, that lived, that had a farm right nearby. The the old couple and then their their son lived right in the neighborhood, and we found the graveyard where his some of his ancestors were buried. So it was as though he had moved back home, so to speak. You know, it was, and then the two families began to find photographs in their family albums of when. Robert's father had actually gone with his father to Nova Scotia to meet these cousins, and there were photographs of them standing in front of old Joe Finney's oxen, team of oxen, and some, some Model T Ford, and those kinds of things. Um, so um, it was it was rather serendipitous, I guess you could say, and. Um, I, you know, I loved it there. I was happy. It was rural. I was used to rural life, and um, we had we had a son. We had a son. Our son was born before oh, we went really? up there. Yeah, and um, but it, the time came. My, Robert didn't make a lot of money with his art because it took him so long to make it that he'd have to borrow money to to get by until a piece was done, and then when he'd sell it, he'd have to use most of the money to pay off the loan and. It was getting it was getting difficult financially, and I realized I was going to have to work. And so, um, and our son was getting old enough; he'd be in school soon. So I, um, when he started school, I went back to to a local uh, university, Acadia University in Wolfville, Nova Scotia, and uh, got my got a. Um, uh, spent a year getting a teaching my teaching bachelor's degree in in teaching. I had finished my bachelor's degree at the University of Maine after we got back from Peace Corps. So I I had only had one year of college, if you remember, from Goucher. After Peace Corps, I finished um, just going piecemeal and. Um, uh, one course at a time. So then you became a teacher then. You were so <clears throat> then, in a, at yeah. a, at, and I had majored in French at the at the, at the University of Maine. Um, I had wanted to major in Spanish because I had learned, you know, started learning Spanish in the Peace Corps, but they didn't have a major. So I said, well, I'll do the next best thing and major in French, which was pretty silly because there was nothing I could do with it, you know. But then we went to Canada, and so I. Um, so I got these teaching, this teaching degree, and um, 
and I um, just began teaching in the in the local elementary school, the same mm. school where my son was, where our son was going at that time. So I t teaching first grade, taught first grade for two years, and then became the reading specialist. Um, my main interest had been reading and teaching reading and how you know how to help children learn to read, and so I became the reading specialist in the school, and I was doing that for four years until we moved back to the United States. And in 1984, we moved back, to, and we moved back to Massachusetts. If I could interrupt you, I, mm. I think from what you said before, <clears throat> it was before, just a little before that, that your mother died. She was died in 1980. That's correct. She died yeah. while we were still living in Nova yeah. Scotia. And then, um, just just briefly, uh, <laughs> then tell us about your father marrying Claudia. Well, he he he. Let's see. Well, how, how did how, she died in 1980? But they had been divorced since 1967. Ah, ah. So they got divorced while I was in the Peace Corps. I see. I, see. Um, I got a, a letter. I had been very worried. <laughs> I'd been very worried about my father living by himself here, you know, um, because he had moved back into this house. And your mother was at Barber. And they had sold Barbary House, yeah. I see. And while I was after I was married and and while I was overseas and. Um, so I was worried about him um, being by himself up here, and, you know, and um, and then I got a letter while I, in halfway through my Peace Corps stint that he had gotten married to this woman, Claudia, and I was mad because I'd been so worried about him and he'd been taken care of and he hadn't <laughs> told me. <laughs> but um, anyway, that, you know, that's irrelevant, but he... Um, so when I came, when we came back to the States and lived in Massachusetts, um, we were in Amherst. Um, I had started my master's degree in, in Canada. And um, so I, trans I transferred to the University of Massachusetts in Amherst and our, we, we put our son in a, in a private school, Eagle Brook School, which is a feeder school for the Deerfield Academy. Mm -hmm. um, because he had not, he was not getting what he needed in the local public school in Canada, and he was getting frustrated and getting into trouble and whatnot, and and we knew he needed he needed more um, stimulus than he was getting. So we came back to the states, and <clears throat> and he um, he just he just thrived. You know, it was just perfect for him, and so I I I was taking courses at the University of. Uh, Massachusetts Amherst. He was going to this Eagle Brook School, and then I, <clears throat> I was also I got a job teaching first grade at the Smith College Campus School. That was the the lab school for the Department of Education at Smith College in Northampton, Massachusetts, and um, and that put us just down the pike from here, uh, down ninety ninety one. And so I was coming up here then. Um, every month or six weeks for for a visit with my father, you know, whom I had not seen a whole lot of since we had moved to Canada, mm -hmm. you know, and that was really that was really nice. And I got to know Claudia, and just you know, by then my mother had been gone for what twenty years or so, not quite, and she was just like a mother to me, you know. She <clears throat> she took that role and um, sort of. You know, you know, silently recall, agreed to be recall, my my mother. <laughs> I recall now. I don't know whether your mother her. <laughs> or your father uh, told me this, but during World War One, their families were on opposite sides. That um, at the, in the beginning, the, the Russians would have been with no, the, that's uh, right. with the yeah, Allies. That's right. And, and then well, I World think War, that she's with, with the Austro-Hungarian, so she would have been on the op Her family would have been on the opposite side. Well, she was born. She was born after World War One. She was born in. But the, the families, I think. Yes. Mike was talking about yeah. The families. That's too. right. Her, yeah, yeah. her, uh, her father was in the in the German army. Yeah. Um, her mother was a, and they lived in Vienna, an uh, Austrian. I guess it would have been the Austrian yeah. army. They lived in. They were. She was born in Vienna, and. Um, her first language was German, really. German. Yep, and and her mother was a fashion designer, an artist. Um, hmm. But her mother was Jewish, and her father was not. He was so when World War Two came around, um, 
that was a problem. And they ended up having to um, just really basically run right ahead of the Germans that were that were tracking okay. down the Ger Jews, anybody yes. who was Jewish. Yeah. And so, um, so they they hot footed it just barely with the f clothes on their backs to Paris, and then and then from there eventually got became, came here. Uh, tell us, uh, tell us how, how Mike and Claudia met. She took his community Russian class at Dartmouth. <laughs> she was also working at the library. Yeah. My mother worked at the library too, but. Um, Claudia was a librarian. She was the art, one of the art librarians at the at Dartmouth College at Baker Library, mm. and um, and she she wanted to learn Russian, and so she signed up for these conversational classes, and she was just bowled over by, <laughs> by him. <laughs> and your and father so, taught these classes. He, yes, he. I. It's really more like facilitating them. I mean, he would he would he would speak in Russian and with them in a conversation. I think they had a, they did have a, a book that they would follow. Hmm. Um, I, I went a few times myself uh, when I was a teenager. Um, he was doing that. Um, I think he, I think he was working with a professor, you know, so that, so that the, the professor could give his students a, a chance to hear, you know, proper Russian. My father spoke educated Russian. And, um, and then he continued, you know, later. Um, but I, I went a few times with it, and it was really people just sitting around, and they would they would practice the the lessons that were in the book and getting the pronunciation right. And my father would correct their pronunciation. Mm. I know when we were growing up, if we'd mispronounced a Russian word, he was right on it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you're very happy then when Claudia married your father. You well, know, I yes. didn't know her, you know, I had never met her. Yeah. And so my, my initial response was to be mad that he hadn't oh. told me that he was being taken <laughs> right. care of. But yeah. when I did meet her, I really liked her yes. and have liked her ever since. Yeah. And, you know, you know um, maybe I can take this opportunity to ask, how is Claudia doing? She's, she's amazing. She's 91 now. 91. She's living with her daughter in Quincy, Massachusetts. Yeah. Um, they just, they just, her daughter just bought a house in Quincy and, um, and she was up here, her, her second, uh, her, her, her first daughter died in 2006 and, um, and, um, is buried here oh. in the Huggins Cemetery. And then last May, her second daughter, Annie, died of cancer. Oh. And so they came up. The, all the Mozoffs and cousins and friends came this summer to have a ceremony at Huggins, um, and they they have a monument there for Annie. They had a, a celebrate a celebration of life, so to speak, and buried her ashes there. Oh. And so Claudia was here, and then after everybody left, um, she stayed for another week with me, just she and I together, which oh, was really yeah. special. For both of us, oh, I think, sure, yeah. Sure. She was, well, I, I hope that Claudia will watch this. But and so she's doing I, well. I can say hello to Claudia from 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 Cornish <laughs> during this interview. Yeah. She'll, yeah. yeah, she would. Well, let's get like let's that. get back to your life then. <laughs> yeah. Uh, continuing on then, um, let's see. Um, had you come back to Maine or? or um, well, we okay. So we'd gone back to Massachusetts. Massachusetts, yes. Um, so I continued with finished my master's degree, began my and 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 began and completed my doctorate in education, and with a focus on you, reading. You have a PhD. Uh, do, yeah, a doctorate of education, an EDD, okay. and um, and I um, so I finished that. My they didn't offer a PhD in in the reading reading education. So I did the EDD instead, you know, and I've just I've just always been interested in in reading, and we we read as children, you know. My mother, we went to the library, and and we had books in the house, children's books in the house. I still have some of those books. Um, my grandmother would send us books, you know, for birthdays and whatnot. So we read a lot, and uh, reading. Would Would Plainfield have been the library you went to? Well, I, I suppose we went to the Cornish Library. Too. Cornish, also, you know, I'm yeah. trying to remember. <clears throat> yeah. We spent our summers in Rhode Island with my grandmother. My grandmother <coughs> had a cottage on the 
on the uh, on uh, Narragansett Bay, I guess it would be, or on the on uh, uh, Sacon the Saconet River in Rhode Island, and um, and the and it was right on the water. So we spent our summers swimming and fooling around in the water all summer. But we went every week to the library there in in Little Compton, Rhode Island, and um, that we didn't have television, of course, so. Um, Reading was what we did in the evenings, reading and playing board games and card games. My grandmother loved to play cards. She taught us lots of card games, and um, we played, you know, Monopoly and all those games. She taught us to knit, my, my sister and me, and to crochet and to embroider. And she felt that that's what young ladies should learn to do. Mm -hmm. And um, But reading, reading was a really big thing, and we just, we just roared through books. And um, so reading was always... A, a, a very important piece of my life always has been, and um, so so I when I went into education, I wanted to focus on reading, and that's that's how I came to be a reading teacher and reading specialist. And then um, when I went to went on to my graduate work, I focused on more advanced understanding and research and reading, and that's what I did at the University of. Massachusetts and Amherst. I did my dissertation in reading in a reading area. <clears throat> and then that was your career? And then mm. I was offered a job at the University of Minnesota and um, teaching teaching in their College of Education, teaching literacy li literacy education courses at the, at the University mm. of Minnesota. And um, I really wanted to do it, um, but it would mean, you know, moving and... Um, the long and short of it was that my husband, you know, I had been sort of following him around for 20 years, 25 years, but he, he decided he didn't want to go to Minnesota. And so we, we sort of essentially went our separate ways and I went out to Minnesota and he, he ended up going back to, to Nova Scotia actually. So he... Did your son go with you? Yeah. And he, well, by then he was in, um, college. Oh, I see. And he went <clears throat> to Williams College. And then he he went to Exeter, Phillips Exeter Academy, yes. for yes. after he was at the Eagle Brook School, he went to Phillips Exeter. And then from there, he went to Williams College. And then from there, he went to the Mayo Medical School. Oh. So he, he became a, he, he is a radiologist. MD. Yeah, oh, sorry. Yeah, uh, an Radio. MD, yeah, radiologist. Yeah, yeah. And then, then so you had a career at Minnesota? So I taught there for eight years, um, and then I switched to the U University of Wisconsin, River Falls. Um, but I was living in St. Paul, um, Minnesota. I had I had by then met my now husband Ed Ed Miranda, and um, we have a condo in St. Paul near St. Paul, Minnesota. And I was commuting to Wisconsin, the University of Wisconsin, I where I was. I was allowed to, I was offered the job of running their master's program in reading. Oh. Um, so I was training reading specialists. And uh, I loved that. You know, that was, that was hmm. really, at the University of Minnesota, I wasn't, I wasn't really allowed to teach the courses I most wanted to teach. Um, um, even though they were in literacy education, they, they, I was teaching language arts and, um, and, uh, mostly language arts courses, and so I I wanted to teach reading courses, reading assessment courses, and and um, children's literature courses. And so at the University of Wisconsin River Falls, I was uh, allowed to do that. That that was what the offer was, and so I I took that offer. Did you finish your career there then? And I finished my career there. Yeah. yeah. So I retired yeah. in 2012. Yeah. Now you mentioned uh, the, the man you married. I know you go back. Is it to Wisconsin for the winter? Minnesota, yeah. Oh, now yep. it's Minnesota. Yeah. Now that's we were living in Minnesota. Oh, I see. And I was I just see. going across the border okay. to the University of Minnesota. And you go back there in the in the winter time now. Yeah, some mm -hmm. people go to Florida. I go to Minnesota. <laughs> <laughs> well, when, um, did, when did you come back here then for the uh, like to live for the summer or something? When I retired <laughs> um, in 2012. I mean, I was coming back anyway. I had made a promise to my father when I took the job in Minnesota that I would come back twice a year for at least twice a year for visits so I did that in the winter and in the summer <clears throat> and I'd stay for a week or two or three you know whatever I could spare and from my job and um and and then when I uh <clears throat> my I I uh 
started purchasing this house from them under a formal mortgage agreement, you know, interest-bearing mortgage agreement in the 1990s. Um, the house needed a lot of work, um, and so I, I, by way of helping keep the house together so that they could live in the house, have lifetime residence in the house, um, I said, well, it's my retirement money, but I will buy it from you, and um, and you just stay as stay for for the rest of your lives. And and they liked that idea, and so um, I was coming back, and each time I'd come back, I'd find out what what needed to be done and take care mm. of that. And I was taking care of the taxes and insurance and everything. And um, and then um, um, let's see, my father died in two thousand and seven. Claudia continued to live here, and then she, um, she her, her, two of her sons lived in California and a daughter in, in uh, Arizona, and she felt she had not been seeing them as much as she wanted to over the few, previous few years, because my father had needed more care, and, um, and it was, you know, the traveling was, it was a long way, and so, um, she decided in when I retired in 2012 that she would go and live with her children in in uh, in on the in the West, um, and um, so then and and because I ha I was now retired and could spend the the requisite amount of time here to be a resident, um, then I began. I came in April that year after I, ret I retired in January, and I came in. April and stayed in, into November, so mm. that I had the six months for residency. And, and that began in 2012? 12, yeah. <clears throat> and so since yeah. 2012, I've officially been a resident here, and I, I, um, I vote here. And, oh, that he's leaving. Um, and, you know, I have be begun to participate in town, yeah. town affairs. I'm on the... Well, Historical I'm, Society, you, you, and I'm on the fair joined, committee. You and joined <laughs> the board of the uh, of the Cornish Historical Society. Yeah, and uh, you have, have fair activities. Also, I'm have? I'm a, I've been a volunteer for several years now on the uh, for the art show and sale. Oh, so I work oh. with Nancy Whiteman and yes, um, yes. and Janice Orion and um, uh, that that yeah. group. Yeah. We you know getting setting up the art show and taking it down, good, and getting, good. soliciting yeah. artists and. Um, what else have I been doing? Oh. <laughs> I go to the senior luncheons. <laughs> <laughs> well, you look after the house. Do you close the house in the wintertime? Um, no. Um, my brother's house is not very well insulated. My brother just lives down down around the corner. And um, and it, and his, his pipes need some work and whatnot. And so it's not a very good place for him to live in the winter. So he house sits for me. He, he moves up here with his cats and... He he makes sure that the that the pipes don't freeze here, and he stays sure. warmer here. Um, and then he moves back down there mm -hmm. when I come in the yeah. spring, in the late spring, I and um, yeah. because I have I have a lot of family that comes who are allergic to cats, and, <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. and I have to. <laughs> yeah. You know, Daisy, I always like to ask people um, Cornish past and present changes. Mm -hmm. that, um, and the first, the first change that people often bring up would be the roads. Now you're not here for the winter, right? But but people uh, people feel that the roads are maintained in a far superior fashion today than they were in the past. Um, do you remember difficulties with the road? Because you're pretty remote up here. Do you remember road difficulties in the past, either with snow well, or with mud or? Um, Oh, you're, yes, now that you trigger that. Um, I remember my father always had a Jeep, always. My grandmother bought him one in nine, when we moved back up here in 1946. And uh, he continued to turn that over and, and keep a Jeep uh, going. Four-wheel drive, low, low, you know, which could handle just about anything. And he had chains for the Jeep. And I can remember, I remember one time... Um, the roads were from here down to Hell Hollow were sheer ice, just just solid ice, and and we got our sleds out, the ones with the metal runners, the what are they called, American flyers, 
and um, and he went ahead of us in the jeep, you know, to in case somebody was coming up the road, he could, you know, stop them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> when you think about it, but anyway, so we 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 slid, we just went flying down the road, and he could just barely stay ahead of us. But he had chains on the on the jeep, and and um, and and he led us down. Did you go all the way to Hell Hollow? Yes, yes. That's quite a distance. Yeah, that was such fun. I just remember that yeah. as being such fun. But when I think about it now, <coughs> what if a car had been trying to come up the road? Where would we have gone with our sleds? I mean, we would have run into the back of the jeep. <laughs> <laughs> but then another time, we were coming up um, the hill, the hill by what's now the Song Garden. You know, from from Fitch's Zorheids mm-hmm. up that hill, um, which is you know a sort of a steady slide, and that was sheer ice. And he and he had chains on then, and we were in the jeep. I guess we're coming back from town or school or someplace, and um, and he was chugging up the hill, and it was it was hard because it was just a sheet of ice, and all of a sudden we just did a complete 360. Just we did the car, the jeep just spun right around, mm. and he's so good, he handles vehicles so well that he just continued driving. You know, he ha- kept it on the road. We didn't go off the road, but did a did a. a spin in place and then continued up the road and I can I can still feel the centrifugal force of that okay. of that spin when we were sitting in the, in the of back course of the we seat. still have difficulties but I mean mm. but people generally would consider the roads to be maintained and yeah and know, then there's a mud a big mud problem coming, oh, up, coming up here up. on Fernal Till Road and but you know I'm not here in mud season and yeah. Michael said a couple of years ago there was quite a bit of mud and last year was it was good but um mm. There, so periodically, sometimes there is more mud, you know, to deal with. Now the um, other, uh, but I, I think they're much better. I yeah. certainly, I think the road crew here does a fantastic I agree. job. I you know, agree. Um, I, agree. I write them a letter every year, just <laughs> thanking them for the job they do. I like that they they trim, you know, they they cut the uh, back the weeds along the sides um, every summer, late summer, yeah. midsummer. Also, I think Kyle, when he was head of the road crew, he he acquired that roller, um, a secondhand roller, so that when they, after they grade the roads, they roll them, and they never used to do that when I was growing up, mm. that I remember, and I think that packs it much better. better. I think that mm. you know the the base is much more solid, mm. but I think they have. I don't know, they must have better techniques for, for the, making the camber of the road or something because they I think they hold up very well. I now mean, the we other, did have that, that one storm. You were, you were uh, I, I remember, didn't the fire department or the rescue squad come up to help Well, that you? was last fall, yeah. 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 But several years ago, Hell Hollow Road washed out, and it washed out so badly that when my husband came, he, he was here at that time, and um, he stood in one of the washouts and his, it was almost, he was almost level, his waist was almost level with the, with what remained of the surface of the road. They had to close, they had to close Hell Hollow Road for, I think, a month or two yeah. um, because of that storm. Oh, it was a storm in June, or early July, July 2nd, several, some, several years, maybe four or five years ago. And it was a horrific storm and just completely washed out roads all over. But they got them back in shape so fast. Um, Yeah, but last fall, when we had that six-day blackout, we had no electricity up here for almost six days. And um, uh, Larry Dingy carried cans of gas up up the road as far as he could get, you know, and, and, and left them and... And then we'd pick up the cans of gas on the other side of these fallen trees, and bring them up here to run the generators Generator. with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's several of several people up here had generators, so we were sharing the generators around. And, okay. Now the other change, um, although you spent a lot of your schooling years away, you did mention one time going to the central school and having like 38 people in the class. Yeah, I graduated yeah. from there. You yeah. know, I yeah, I went from fourth to eighth grade. The, um, the change now is very apparent in terms of the declining school enrollment. Yeah. Um, do you have any thoughts on why the, uh, the enrollment ha- has declined so yeah. drastically? Well, um, 
ap you know, after I, uh, people were homeschooling their children, so they, they weren't in the school. The Smiths homeschooled their daughters. Steve Peters homeschooled his children. Um, somebody else who was the other family that homeschooled. So that took children out of circulation. Stuart will say, Stuart Hodgman will say that it's because so much land is in current use and people can't find a place to build a house. But when I was a child, we had five children. Turneys had 11 children. I mean, there were a lot more children living in each house and going to the school than there are now. People aren't having as many children. And there are actually more houses along here than there were when I was growing up. But there are fewer, fewer, fewer children in them. They only, the, the people that bought Steve Peters, I think they have one or two instead of, you know, and then there's there none, you know, we're all a little older up here now. Um, so I think a, a, a new generation of young people hasn't taken over the, um, the houses that are available here with, with younger children. That might be one part of it. Um, so people not having as many children, I think. Well, Stuart is not alone in thinking that. Um, mm -hmm. When I've done these interviews, um, it, the issue has been raised that our land use policies in Cornish are not encouraging younger families mm -hmm. you know, to move in. Mm -hmm. uh, we have five acre zoning, for example. Mm -hmm. Current use takes a, a lot of land mm -hmm. you know, that could otherwise, you know, we all want to preserve open space and we all wa want to preserve farming. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. um, do you have any thoughts on our land use policies in relation to it? Well, of course, I'm my father's daughter, um, and and he put a lot of his land into yes. into uh, into conservation. conservation. Yes, um, and he encouraged other people to do that too. And his argument was always that the people that that land that's in current use is not using services. You know, we don't need we don't need cable TV for the trees, and we don't need um, uh, water and power. You know, and um, roads for the you know uh, maintaining roads, um, the the roads that that used to go down through the Ripley place there past the the road that went past the cemetery, that land is is in conservation and belongs to my um, cousins, a couple of cousins, my father's mm. brother, <clears throat> yeah. Um, of course, that does limit the ability yeah. for housing. Yes. But it yes. But then, as I said, there are not that many people with children living in the houses that are here. Um, mm -hmm. if, if, I look at the, if I look at the houses between here and Martha Zorheids, there are people in those houses, but they, they're all people whose children have grown up, yes. and, mm -hmm. um, and the, the next generation hasn't come in yet. So, um, you know, we're not, ex we're not expanding, but, we're, but the, it isn't that the... It, it isn't that the that the places for houses aren't there. Um, I mean, the houses are there. They just don't have kids in them right yeah. now. Okay. You know, I'm, I there, there's a a beautiful portrait here that I I I want to, to actually end with um, Billy taking a picture and you talking about it. But but tell me first before we do that. Um, I think I've asked all the questions that I wanted to. Um, do you have any other things that you would like to add? Uh, to what we've gone over, or well, there were there were things I remember as a child. Um, uh, we used to in the barn. Um, we used to have loose hay when I was very young. No, this is the barn that's right back. No, the, the the barn isn't there anymore. It's oh, where the oh. garden plot is. Oh, it was one of the old you know fashioned barns with a hay mow and stanchions oh, oh. and everything. Um, I remember. I remember sitting in front of the 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 cows were fed from one side and milked from the other, and there were there were uh, um, feed troughs, you know, in front of them, so they would eat while they were being milked, and we could sit on the other side and watch them eat their silage and their grain and their hay, and I used to sit, love to sit and just watch the cows chew. You know, I, 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 I've always liked watching animals and, and sort of biology inside. One time I thought I'd like to be a biologist and, and I'd watch this, this jaw going around like this, chewing their, chewing their food and then chewing their cuds. 
And I, I just remember being fascinated by, by animal behavior. And that's something that, that, that a farm kid gets to, <clears throat> gets to do because there's the time to sit there and, and just watch. I remember one time we had a, ra a ram and it, was, it, it knocked me over, you know, it butted me and knocked me over. And, um, just little, little memories yeah. like that, sure. swinging from a rope in the uh, in the bar in the hay mow, you know, gr climbing up onto the hay mow and then grabbing a rope and swinging down. My father kind of taught us how to do that. Um, we had a rope swing from a butternut tree that was out here that we would that he put up for us that we would swing from. Um, so, lot you know, lots of little images I have of of growing up on a farm that that I stayed with you that I've that have stayed with me that I've that I've enjoyed. Yeah. I remember we would. Um, they'd cut the the corn, uh, and by you know cut the corn stalks and pile them onto a wagon, um, <clears throat> and then we would ride back from the cornfield on the top of this wagon load of of corn stalks, hmm. and always wondering if we were going to slide off it because the corn was a bit slippery, you know. And they'd bring the corn back here, and and then there was a. a a chopper that they'd feed the corn stalks into, and it would it would chop the corn up into silage and blow it up into the si silo. And um, it's a wonder we didn't, you know, get ourselves chopped up along the <laughs> along <laughs> with it. There was a the chopper was run by a a, a power bar on the tractor, and um, and I remember that the the I I don't understand the mechanics of it, but that the the belt that ran the power bar had to be twisted in order to and it, it wasn't a straight run but it had a, a like a figure eight to make it work so somehow the the, the mechanics of it required that um, I can remember seeing that and being fascinated by the by the image of this this um, belt and the way it would it would turn it and the and the movement of it and that mm. kind of thing and just lots of lots of images like that I stayed, with, I stayed with you yeah <clears throat> and we'd get inside the silo <clears throat> and let the silage come down on us when it was being blown <laughs> mm. into the silo i heard i read years later that you can you can dive <laughs> from the carbon monoxide or something from the, from the silage fumes mm. but we didn't <laughs> Um, you know, farms are pretty dangerous places, I guess, but somehow we, we survived Sorry. all of that. Good. You know, Good. Um, um, you know I'd like, um, Billy, to, to focus. There's a magnificent portrait there. And uh, Daisy, if, uh, could you tell us about the, uh, about the woman that's there and the history? Of yes. That? Well, she, she's my great-grandmother on the Scottish side. She was married to, she, her name is Jemima Jackson Thomas. And she was married to Francis Thomas, who was the British consul in Kiev, Ukraine, at, in uh, in uh, during the period of World War One, in the in the um, uh, early part of the last century. Um, she, um, I think, I think she was a actually a deaconess, maybe in a in a Protestant church in a Presbyterian church. In Scotland, but not in not in Kiev, and um, the she um, this portrait was painted from a photograph. Um, my my uh, mother actually had it commissioned by a portrait artist in the 1950s. Oh, oh really? Yes, yeah. and um, and it was a photograph. Which I have, I have a, on my computer, um, but it was the she was sitting next to um, to my grandfather, um, so it was her son-in-law, and next to him was uh, her daughter uh, Margaret, nicknamed Daisy, and then next to her was her sister Ella, and then. At the uh, at the far end was my grand uh, was her husband Francis Thomas, and we've determined that 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 photograph was taken in 1910 and that it was the wedding picture of my grandmother and grandfather, my father's father and mother, in Kiev, 
So they were married in Kiev, and <clears throat> and this, just say that again. Your father's my 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 father's uh, mother and father when they got married. So your so, father's mother and well, that is the mother and and father. Yeah, she's yeah. the she's the okay. she's the mother-in-law of of my grandfather, and um, and so and she's a Scotswoman, and um, she was born in Perth, Scotland. My my her daughter Margaret, nicknamed Daisy, was born in Saint Petersburg because they happened to be there when she needed to get born. Um, and they had spent a good part of their adult lives uh, in Russia because they were in the diplomatic corps, in the diplomatic service. And um, they ended up actually, they were in Kiev when the, when the Bolshevik Revolution occurred, when the World War II, uh, World War I took place, and, um, and then the Bolshevik uh, Revolution happened. And they were actually kind of trapped in Kiev, in the embassy, um, or the consulate, um, when the Bolsheviks shut the borders down and um, sort of separated from the rest of Europe. And um, she died of just old age and, and probably not getting enough food and medicine. Um, she was elderly. and. Um, and then eventually he did too. And, and one family story is that he ended up really starving to death because the Bolsheviks wouldn't give him any food because he was, you know, he was on the other side. He was, yeah. he was, he had been connected to the imperial government. And um, I don't know if that's true, but it's my understanding yeah. that they're both buried in an English cemetery in Kiev. In Kiev. Some, someday I would, if I live long enough for the, relationships with Russia to improve. I'd like to go there and see if I can find their graves. Yeah. It's a, it's marvelous it's a painting, really. It's yeah, it's a, it's it I think it's, it's nice. Good. I like it. And I've actually had copies made, smaller copies that I've given to my sisters. Um, okay. Um, okay. Well, I think um, I think we've covered everything. <laughs> and uh, the tip of the iceberg. <laughs> <laughs> you're, 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 yeah. Yeah.